You're watching This Week in Space with Miles O'Brien. Brought to you by Binary Space. Reliable space systems. Hello and welcome. It was a nail biter. Sample return missions always are. But in the end, JAXA pulled it out and the troubled Japanese Hayabusa mission to land on an asteroid and collect a sample ended on a high note. Check out this video of the reentry. A small capsule containing dust from the asteroid Itakawa touched down Sunday at the Woomera test range in the Australian outback. Launched in May 2003, Hayabusa suffered a host of technical problems and malfunctions. But in the end, it came home. By the way, we found this interesting live feed with the Japanese video crew welcoming Hayabusa back. Note the purple-haired lady dressed as Hayabusa. Don't give us ideas like that here at TWIST. We might actually use them. Anyway, for those of you keeping score, NASA is one for one on sample return missions in recent years. The Genesis spacecraft, which returned a sample of the solar wind to Earth for analysis, cratered in the desert of Utah's Dugway Proving Ground back in 2004. That's when its drogue parachute failed to deploy. Some of that sample return survived, though. On a happier note, the Stardust spacecraft successfully returned a dust sample from the tail of a comet. That was VILT-2 and happened two years later in 2006, also in the Dugway Proving Ground. And to answer your final question, yes, I know what it is. Hayabusa means peregrine falcon. While the Japanese were celebrating, well, the South Koreans not so much. They had a bad day on Thursday, as they say in the rocket business. A Russian-built Naro-1 rocket launched from the Naro Space Center and all appeared fine at first, but mission controllers lost contact with it 137 seconds into flight. Korean news reports indicated it exploded and crashed, not seen here on this video. This is the second failure in two tries for the South Koreans, who are attempting to establish a toehold in the satellite launch club. Currently, eight countries and Europe have established launch capability. And before we leave the Pacific Rim... Doo -doo 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 -doo. All right, that was pathetic. But anyway, what was that glowing spiral in the sky over Australia last Saturday? Could it be aliens? Well, as it turns out, no. It was actually Falcon 9. Despite the spate of UFO reports that were phoned into TV stations around Australia, SpaceX founder Elon Musk told our friends at Space.com that folks were actually seeing his Falcon 9 venting propellants after it rocketed to orbit. The sun caught the event at just the right angle to put on a show for the Aussies. Thousands of contractor employees who work on the Constellation program have known for a while that the pink slips were coming, ever since the Obama administration announced plans to cancel the moonshot project in February. But now it looks like they may be hitting the unemployment line earlier than they thought. NASA has told big contractors Lockheed Martin and ATK to come up with the money to cover the costs of bringing Constellation to an end, even though Congress has not signed off on the cancellation yet. It seems Lockmart and ATK are contractually required to pay those termination costs, which will total about a billion dollars. Now those companies will likely have to lay off workers to pull that money together. Expect this latest development to further poison the already nasty debate going on between the administration, NASA, and Congress over the future of manned spaceflight. We'll have more on that for you in next week's show. And speaking of programs that are ending, the shuttle program is winding down. But don't go thinking you've seen it all, been there, and done that. Check out this video from Inside Atlantis, shot May 26th at the Kennedy Space Center, right after the orbiter returned from 12 days in space. It's the first time NASA has ever released video from inside the orbiter during this time. Those are workers from Prime Shuttle Contractor United Space Alliance in the crew compartment going through a checklist to prep the spacecraft for its tow back to the hangar. As you know, there are just two more shuttle missions left on the manifest. And NASA has cranked up a fun public outreach program to get folks involved. Send your face to space. You can upload a picture of yourself at the website faceinspace.nasa.gov, and they'll fly your mug on one of the final missions. I could actually have some fun with that. Members of the ISS Expedition 23 crew are back on terra firma. Oleg Kotov, Soichi Noguchi, and TJ Kramer parachuted to a landing on the steppes of Kazakhstan in a Russian Soyuz last week. We've gotten used to the spectacular landing pics, compliments of NASA lensman Bill Ingalls, 
But here's a never before seen view from a camera on an all terrain vehicle, part of the Russian Search and Recovery Forces team. In the end, all was well with the Expedition 23 crew. Expedition 24 crew members are set to blast off next week, and heck, might have already happened by the time you watch this, so check in with us at spaceflightnow.com for all the up to the minute status reports. The Mars rover Spirit may have fallen on some hard times recently. She's stuck in the sand and in hibernation mode during the Martian winter. But she made some news this past week anyway. Imagine that, making news in your sleep. Well, scientists have been poring over data collected by Spirit back five years ago and have identified high concentrations of magnesium iron carbonate in a rock outcropping called Comanche. That in turn suggests Mars may once have harbored a wet, non-acidic environment that could have been favorable for life. Principal investigator Steve Squires is hailing the finding as one of the most significant ever for either of the rovers. Could there be methane-based life on Saturn's moon Titan? Before anyone gets carried away, let's be really clear. Scientists don't know, and the consensus is probably not. But new data published this week from Cassini suggests some interesting chemical interactions happening on the surface of Titan that raise some intriguing possibilities. It seems hydrogen atoms settling down from the atmosphere are disappearing at ground level, and new maps of surface hydrocarbons show a lack of a chemical called acetylene. Both would be an excellent food source for a methane-based life form. Experts are quick to point out that there are a number of non-biological explanations for what's going on with those chemicals. Hmm. And while we're in the Saturn system, check out this lightning. Those are actual lightning flashes as seen by Cassini on the night side of Saturn, in a cloud illuminated by the planet's rings. By Earth standards, this would be a massive storm. The cloud is nearly 2,000 miles wide. The thunder you hear is actually enhanced for your listening pleasure. The lightning does produce radio waves that instruments on Cassini can pick up, but the frequencies are above the range of the human ear. But as Marlon Perkins used to say on Wild Kingdom, all scenes, whether actual or created, reflect true facts. Time for me to thunder on out of here. Thanks to our sponsor, Binary Space, we really appreciate their support. If you want to send us a note, shoot us an email to twist at spaceflightnow.com, tweet us at This Week in Space, meet us on the blog at milesobrien.com, and don't forget to stop on that PayPal link to help keep us on. Next week, next stop, Orbit. New crew members blast off from Baikonur en route to their home on the ISS. We'll bring you all the details. See you then.